Hello, everyone. My name is Joanne Lockwood, and I am your host for the Inclusion Bites podcast. In this series, I will be interviewing a number of amazing people and simply having a conversation around the subject of inclusion, belonging, and generally making the world a better place for everyone to thrive. If you'd like to join me in the future, then please do drop me a line to joe.lockwood at cchangehappen.co.uk. That's S-double-E, changehappen.co.uk. You'll be able to catch up with all of the shows on iTunes, Spotify, and the usual places. So plug in your headphones, grab a decaf, and let's get going. Today, it's episode 17, with the title, Leave No One Behind. And I have the absolute honor and privilege to be joined by Dr. Jackie Taylor. Jackie and I met online in a Facebook group for professional speaking. Yet another relationship borne out and forged by the coronavirus lockdown. Jackie describes herself as one of the 100 global leaders 2019 and in the top 10 global Internet of Things innovators. She doesn't just predict the future, she engineers it using cutting edge website research. I can't wait to find out what that means. I asked Jackie to describe her superpower and she said, I build deep technology which unlocks inclusion outcomes for all. Hello, Jackie. Welcome to the show. Hi, Joe. Delighted to be here speaking to you today from somewhere outside of London. Oh, brilliant. I hope the uh, the weather's not quite as hot and sticky as it has been all week. Oh, my goodness. No, much better today. And I'm lucky to be in my studio, which is climate controlled. The rest of the uh, the house isn't, but the studio is. So I, I would manage normally, but goodness me. We've been, it's been exciting times on all of that rushing around or trying not to. Wow, I'm so jealous. Okay, Jackie, so what do you mean by leave no one behind? Well, as a web scientist, and I probably should explain that first, um, I've not always been a web scientist. My career uh, started as an aerospace engineer, um, but it was disrupted quite rapidly and rudely um, with the death of my mother. So I had to take some time out in order to keep my family together and to look at, you know, how life would would carry on. So I took a two year gap in that and and reset my studies after that. That, I would say, focused my mind beyond my own bubble. I think when you're in your pre-20s, you tend to be in your own sort of bubble. And when you have um, a a traumatic incident like that, it tends to expose you to the fact that the world doesn't always run on parallel tracks or on on, on known tracks. And and essentially, when I qualified, um, I'd put together some cutting-edge research that actually looked at solving one of the problems our aerospace industry had when in the um, it creates noise pollution for our society. And I'd worked with engineers to produce new jet engine technology that reduced that pollution. So even as an aerospace engineer, I was looking at this from a societal point of view. Um, and that was fantastic. You know, my, my dissertation gave birth to a brand new aircraft and I didn't get to work on it. Because what happened there was I was female and female engineers back in the day were very few and far between. And the client that bought the aircraft off plan was from the Middle East and didn't need me influencing what happened with that plane into the sky. So I found myself having done all this pioneering work with no career path. The MD of the aerospace company, pilot friend of mine, said, what we have here is something quite unique. Let's look at it in a different way. I said, that's great. He said, so can you just go in and sort out all those, all those technologists who don't seem to do what you do? And that began my career as technology can be created, birthed, engineered. I was part of the initial movement to create a movement in technological software engineering. Engineers that actually said, don't build technology like this build it from engineering principles. And so I learned um, over 35 years ago now that actually what we can do is build technology that includes everybody. And what that's called is something called deep tech, deep technology. And that's something very unique in the technology world. It's 
built from engineering principles, so that my early work in and career in software engineering, but it actually includes some major scientific advances. And that's where web science came in. I'd never heard of it either. And Tim Berners-Lee introduced me to it because he made it up. And so the combination of my engineering background and the web science, the fundamental web science I've created, actually underpins the inclusion agenda we deliver um, all across the world. And that allows us to be able to build technology which is accessible and utilizes the talent. Specifically, originally, was around Generation Z, their 27 to 7 today. But as of my speech at Davos in January 2019, Generation Alpha, they're 16 to 6. So that's me and that's what I do. Wow. I mean, you... You just name dropped in there big time, didn't you? You just chucked Tim Berners Lee <laughs> in there. I mean, that's a, a bit of a powerful name drop right at the beginning of the podcast. Kudush, straight into the water. So that, I mean, was he must have been very influential at the time, or, or, or has his his uh, reputation grown since you knew him? Was this in the early days of the web? Well, he. I mean, we're speaking today on a podcast that you're going to send out to the world, and he. He, over 30 years ago, connected two technical protocols and said, how do I world? And that's the reason you can do what we do. We're speaking remotely. That's the reason for the fabric of how our society is woven with the World Wide Web. But it was interesting, this fundamental web science, which I'm not sure whether we get into, but was around um, uh, leveling up the opportunities for our young people who at the time were 17 to 7 and the technology I built to leave no one behind. Tim said to me, he said, I found out what you've done, which is a scary thing. He, he tends to talk in, in uh, he's very focused when he speaks. I found out what you've done. I need you in the Royal Society. It's the 20th anniversary of the web. We need to get this thing moving. So it was the, um, it was the 12th of March, 2009. And I mean, if Tim Menelzee asked you to go somewhere, you go. Uh, no idea what it was about. I went. And it was, it's changed my life because he, had the his his if he was here today, what he would say is the reason I did what I did was to uh, enable humanity to find its own truth. That's what he says. He says that anyway. If anybody ever asks him the right question, and that was what he started that meeting out with. We were there for an entire day, and what he said is, you walked in here from all your disciplines. I was an aerospace engineer, um, but you walk out of here as web scientists. It doesn't matter what that means. It means whatever it needs to mean. But in order to to put a societal, um, uh, in order to enable his vision of humanity to discover its own truth, we needed to include everybody. And in the 20th anniversary of the web, for 20 years on, what he effectively said was, I haven't managed to do that. We have 18% of the world online and you lot are here to figure out how to change that. And so, you know, that was um, that was 11 years ago. And now we have over 50 percent of the world online. We paced the, the build out of the web to 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 give people access. There's more of it available than than people are connected. So anybody chooses to be connected, they're in. Um, and beyond 80 percent of humanity, it's slightly different. There's a different. Um, piece to be done there and that's the piece we work on now at my company Flying Binary but for 80% of the world connected you can make a personal choice and you're in and and Tim you know we worked with him for 11 years and um, that vision of uh, I translated that connect humanity to its own truth to in my view what Flying Binary would do my company would do is, is work out how to develop the technology to make that vision true and to leave no one behind. So that's what I mean by inclusion. Well, wow. yeah. I mean, I'm just, as you're talking now, I'm just reflecting. I mean, I'm in my mid, well, still in my mid fifties, but just about 56, I think. So yeah, mid fifties. And my life is inconceivably different to it would have been without the internet, without the web. And, you know, I grew up in the early eighties, well, at school in the early eighties, and the web just wasn't a thing. Mobile phones, they weren't a thing. Phones, the best you have was a cordless phone in your bedroom connected to a base station somewhere. And this is a big chunk of a brick. 
And I remember getting into IT, into computing, desktop computing in the mid 80s, just after the IBM PC launched, when there was, we used to call it IBM PC compatible because there were so many incompatibles <laughs> and Apple was still producing their own version of stuff and there was no standards in the web processing units. So there was no real standard of communication between PCs. And we had things like the Gopher protocol and the early, early SMTP protocols were coming out and all these various sort of technologies were remaining niche about universities connecting through their own inter internet type early stage, ARPANET, I think it was called in those early stages. Mm, yeah, that's right, the, ARPANET. The university yeah. communicator. And then uh, Gopher seemed to be like quite a leading kind of protocol. Then HTTP and um, HTML kicked in with, with Tim. yes, yeah. Yes, and that's when it started. I mean, even HTTPS wasn't really a thing in the early stages. There was no such thing as, as uh, trust and encryption because people tended to trust each other anyway. It's only That's when right. the bad guys got involved, really, that we had to start worrying about eavesdropping. <laughs> and you know, bad guys have, have been responsible for a lot of technology advancements, but they've also snookered a lot of good ideas, haven't they? Yes, absolutely. And that's the work I do today as a web scientist. So I work on the dark web, which is where those people inhabit and essentially work in the, in the cyber space um, to ensure that we maintain that vision of humanity connected to its own truth despite what you've just, the phenomenon of the cyber criminals that you're talking about, despite that. So that's the work we do every day at Flying Binary. Yeah, I, I remember, I think I was about 14 and I was uh, in geography and we, we were set homework and it was called Sheep Farming in Patagonia. And we had to write an essay on sheep farming in Patagonia. So as a 14 year old, Right. What were my options? What were my options? I had to go to the local library. I had to hunt through uh, some research. I had no way of finding this. And eventually I found a book, I think, with about a page in it of, 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 that was relevant. And uh, I think I got a D for it because I, I, didn't, I didn't perceive to do enough research. I spent days on this. And I think <laughs> now I can, I, can, I can whip the phone at my pocket. I could type sheep farming in Patagonia. And in fact, I will try this afterwards. Uh, <laughs> and I, I can get articles and opinions and journals from all over the world, not just from Argentina or, or South America, uh, that can give me the answers to my question. So when we talk about accessibility of data, accessibility of information, uh, inclusion in terms of allowing people to communicate, could we, we couldn't have survived lockdown and coronavirus 30 years ago, or even 10 years ago, could we? No, absolutely not. And it reminds me of Gen Alpha is who we build for today. So to unlock their talent so that they can bring their talents to the world. And it reminds me of a video that a mum sent me, which is actually on YouTube if you want to go look for it, where the mum gives her little girl a magazine, a hard copy magazine. And she immediately does what any of Gen Alpha do, because um, they're a kinesthetic generation, is she swipes it, she, she touches it. And she passes it back in seconds and says, it doesn't work. Mum replaces it with an iPad. And then the child goes and does what she's looking for. And, and the thing about Gen Alpha is they're our first generation where they're immersed in what we've talked about. So I'm a baby boomer myself. And, and essentially, I've, I've done that trajectory. I was, as I said, I was catapulted into technology against my will as an aerospace engineer. And, and came back to now, uh, well, in that 11 years ago when I met Tim, to the in industrial internet of things, which is what we build. That's what deep tech is. And, and essentially, that's because we, we are in a situation now where we can connect to being, to do whatever we do. It doesn't matter what generation we're from, we can. But Gen Alpha are a kinesthetic generation that assume to be immersed in this stuff. They, they, would, they just have no concept of the idea. It's not available if they want to know. And so I call the Gen Alpha generation the curious generation. The previous generation, Gen Z, there are web entrepreneurs. They're 27 to 70 days. And they actually, they influence 40% of the economic spend across the world. So, so they have introduced us to the explore space. But Gen Alpha introduces to the curious space. So it's no coincidence that inclusion is becoming such a pervasive um, uh, focus for lots of the world because Gen Alpha know no reason why it shouldn't be. And, and if you don't believe me, you know, Greta Thunberg and her climate change thing is why is all this nonsense going on? What on earth are you all doing? Let's just fix this. And so they are 
in their kinesthetic way, they will reach those resources, which are everywhere. And this, the acceleration of the adoption of the web and the, the, the um, bringing humanity on to be able to use its resources to discover its own truth is, is an accelerating phenomenon now. So for those of us that were pre web generation, even pre internet generation, it's been a slow path. But for Gen Z and Gen Alpha, they know no different. So if, if you know anybody or you've reared somebody as I have who's 27 or under, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You may have nephews or nieces, uh, neighbors' children. You go, you know exactly what you're talking about. What what, what we, at Joanne and I, are talking about today. It's really interesting that that becomes and frames our world. And lockdown has as effectively typified the acceleration of all of that work. Mm. I mean, us, us oldies still have this concept of digital detox where we seem to we, we want to sort of say, I've, I've had enough now I need to reject this and, and sort of go offline for a month or so uh, but the gen alphas and gen z's have this concept of detox because they're so immersed in the technology technology is their their channel their world can they switch off i mean is that good for their health i mean are we living this 24 by 7 world of connection is that good for our mental health well, it's an interesting question that because it's a multifaceted question, but and there's there's a, a number of ways of looking at it. But to boil it down to two essential ways, um, as humans, the the human contact, which of course has been a feature of this lockdown in terms of our lack of it or a reduction of it or our limitation of it, I think most people would say we've understood our dependency on other humans as part of lockdown. Because denying us those social contacts or doing them as we are today via a video platform has very much defined things. And we've, we've understood we miss that social contact. So, so there's that element of it. But the other element of it is my work on the dark web. Not everything we access online is something that is good for us. But how do we tell the difference? And the answer is you can't. And we can have a long debate about that, but, you know, the reality of it is you can't. So I, um, this week, have kicked off a new project, which is based on the evidence we've we've assembled, safeguarding our young people um, from the cyber criminals during lockdown. We call it the social guardian. And that's because they call it the social guardian. Jen Alpha have said, I, I feel we need a social guardian to help us navigate when we are online, the unplug or not, I have many uh, parents that I've worked with in lockdown where we've had this conversation, um, don't wind them up by asking to unplug, find them other things to do, and they will, you know, they will adopt the, the thing that works best for them. But what we now have is a phenomenon where the online harm we suffer is actually trans is not transparent to us. We don't know when we're suffering. So the social guardian is the, what Gen Alpha have helped me put together during lockdown as part of that safeguarding. And we will effectively, we, what we are going to do is build them an app based on what we've been doing during lockdown to support their their mental health um, in order to, to create this fundamental research, which, you know, is very directed at the moment around Gen Alpha um, but we are looking at that. Some of the the online harm that people suffered during lockdown, Jen Alpha suffered during lockdown, has been quite destructive. So it's going to be looking in the acute mental health care. But obviously, we will assemble the evidence and the means of of looking at everybody's um, mental well being. Although we again will be focused on Gen Z and Gen Alpha and how they can navigate this world with their own options, but know when it's not safe for them. And so to be able to configure that from a personal point of view. Yeah, for sure. Uh, when I talk about inclusion, uh, when we talk about to companies around doing inclusion um, surveys, demographics, uh, when, when companies say, well, we find it really difficult to get people to contribute or to share, uh, my first reaction is, well, there's a low trust environment. People won't trust your their data with you if they don't understand what you're going to do with the data, what the reason, what's their why for giving you the data. So we're moving to a cyber world now where we can't trust what we see, what we hear, we have deep fake technology. I mean, I'm sure you're, you, you've, you've got a lot of um, opinions on deep fake. Um, we've got a lot of fake news. Um, world leaders are speaking truth that is fake. 
So when do, do, can we trust world leaders anymore? Can we can we trust that it's actually them speaking when we've got AI that can voice synthesize? Um, it's not like the old Mission Impossible where they're cutting bits of mag tape and sticking them together to make the words. <laughs> good. You just feed their entire speech repertoire into an AI processor, and you can then speak exactly like them, indistinguishable and yep. deep fake. We can invent faces. We can make moving videos now, and actually synthesize. I mean, if you look at the last Star Wars movie. Uh, Princess Leia, mm-hmm. Carrie Fisher, had already died, yet they, yeah. they had her in the film. Is there a future for actors? Do we need actors anymore? Can we just synthesize our <laughs> own actors and create our own AI? Um, I mean, how do we trust what we're saying? So it's a, it's a really good set of questions, and there's no simple answer, and we need a completely other po- podcast to discuss that. But perhaps what I can do is try to coalesce some of that concern and interest and you know, excitement actually around that future you're painting. The, the industrial internet of things, which is what, what I do as a web scientist, that's what we build, that's what we engineer, um, is something that has, since my daughter's speech in 2019, has, has become understood for the governments across the world. Um, initially, for me, it was to be appointed as an expert advisor to the G20. Now, G20 are the member countries that actually, uh, um, they, they create 60% of the world's GDP. So they are the core group of countries collaborate together on an annual basis and throughout that. I first got involved in 2019 and um, on, on one of the member countries Japan, but then in, in um, 20, the end of 2019, I was appointed to the group itself. And the reason for that appointment was partly what you said, and partly because the world's growth and how it's, how it's been moving forward has been slowing and shrinking. And essentially, the, the, the question they posed to me was, is there a way of looking at this in a, with a different lens? And the answer is, of course, there is that lens is inclusion, because unlocking the talents of our future workforce, which is what they're focused on the future, Gen Z and Gen Alpha require very different interventions than what we have now. So I was able to, um, uh, when we had our digital economy kickoff, which is the digital economies of all of the G20 in February in the Middle East, I was able to put a global plan together with a 4.4% growth for all of the countries to be able to move forward on, but had to be an inclusion agenda. That's the only way they would achieve it. Now, if you can do that in the Middle East and you're interested in inclusion, there's nothing that you're looking at that you can't do. I take you back to my earlier statement as I started as an aerospace engineer I didn't get my career because the Middle East had bought those planes and didn't need a woman on board. But then I forward that to 2020 because I delivered that plan formally um, in February 2020. And I was in the Middle East telling them how they will run their world and actually how the G20 will need to be orchestrated. So you take that whole thing and we are effectively flipping the model upside down. Now, be careful what you do, because obviously you get involved in this. There's a, there's an awful lot to come come uh, out of it. What I would say is anybody working on the inclusion agenda, agenda now, the timing is there. We have, because what happened after that was the United Nations got in touch. I'm a science diplomat for Her Majesty's government. I work with other governments that need the sorts of interventions we're talking about, not limited to the G20. And they said, we'd love that plan. And I said, that would be lovely, but that G20 plan won't work for you. We have different needs across the rest of the world. And essentially, the G20 global plan is translated to national plans anyway. Do you know what I mean? There is an overarching agreement. We will move forward on a growth agenda using inclusion as our driver. But how you do that in the UK or Japan or Australia is actually different because each economy is different. And so I'm, uh, I've been appointed an expert advisor to translate that to what does the UN need to do to drive its agenda forward. And the UN is actually very different. The UN is looking at a sustainable future. So it's not particularly focused on growth. It wants the future to be sustainable, a better world for all. For those of you listening, if you haven't looked up the UN 17 
Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, do look that up because whatever field you're working in, I guarantee you that a core SDG is where you're working, you know, one of the 17. But secondary SDGs are the changes you're making. So so now the UN has reset what I call a new social contract. It turns out that that G20 um, digital economy plan was a COVID plan. I didn't know that. That's not why we did it. We did something for three years hence about how we navigate the new growth agendas. But it turns out that because of COVID and they, one billion people have worked from home since we went into lockdown, what I call the isolation economy. And it turns out that that actually accelerates that G20 plan. So we've embedded um, inclusion in a global plan for effectively now 180 economies, 180 nations. Not because we did that, not because any of the G20 or UN team are brilliant, but because we we did the right thing, we took the right focus and circumstances, the timing of that was literally five weeks before lockdown, five w- weeks before this pandemic was declared as such. find it fascinating that you know, you do the right thing and, you know, people say the world moves to support you. Uh, yeah, that's what's happening. We are all working in this arena. That world is now opening up to look at the lens that we use. And in my particular case, leave no one behind to use that same lens. Mm. I mean, technology is, is moving at such a rapid pace at the moment, as, as we know. And you're, you're a technologist as well. You're, you're, and I, I get turned on and sexy by by technology. I, I love shiny <laughs> new things. Uh, I've got a desk full of gadgets here, um, all most of them born out of the streaming community, which is definitely the Gen Alpha, Gen Z stuff. It is. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm right into the sort of th- that kind of technology. But is there a danger when we talk about leaving no one behind that the, the gulf between generations is going to rapidly increase? Where if you're not tech savvy, you're not adaptable to a, a new thinking, then you'll become kind of obsolete in, in the demands of the future. I mean, there's a, there's a huge gap where people who are internet savvy and not internet savvy, but in the future, we've got to be AI savvy. We've got to be innovative. We've got to be, we've got to be dark web savvy. We've got to be savvy against cybercrime. And, and we still see people having their bank accounts empty where they they have too much trust of people online. So are we going to end up with this massive gulf? How do we not leave people behind of, of my age, you know, mid fifties? How, how am I going to keep up? Well, I think it's the, one of the things that I need to be really clear about is it's changing for everybody. Um, technology is my superpower. It's changing for me too. So where we are today is only a signal of how far away we are from where we need to be. And our future workforce, when I took that evidence base from G20, the original piece I'd done for Davos, I actually did for the G20 nations. Two million young people under the age of 36. So when you want to reach out and say, what are the, in our counterterrorism world, we have something called the wicked question, the question we need an answer to that we can't possibly know. And we have technology that we call web intelligence. We can reach out to an individual, any individual on the planet, anywhere, and ask them a set of what we call wicked questions. And we did that. So we asked our future workforce, we said, the sorts of questions you're asking me, we ask them those questions. Very interestingly, two million people had the answers across the world. And of those two million, 40,000 actually knew where the problems were. And one of the issues that you're talking about there is how do we pace that forward um, was, was at the core of that. So where we are now is We've done the work to look at how big that problem is because you can't solve a problem you don't understand. Um, and so 80 countries have volunteered their information post the G20 work. And only 40 of those countries are ready to make that change that we're talking about. So of the 180 countries that are part of my UN work, only 40 are prepared to make that change. But this is the bit that might surprise you. We talk about technology and Joanne. Joanne, you're a technologist in that you get deep dive, like you say, you like shiny. I'm not a fan of shiny. I've got a whole team who are fans of shiny. 
but shiny is not my thing. I, technology needs to get out of my way. I'm, I can break anything and I've, I've spent a career breaking tech. And so I'm the ultimate tester. If it gets off my desk, it can go live. But, but interestingly, the, the category of what we had to ask across those 180 countries was who has the skills? But the, the reality of it was only 40 countries could say their digital economies had the skills to copy a file or to use email. So you're talking about technologies that are way in advance from that spectrum of how good am I with tech? And so we have a whole program that we're developing around how do we bridge that gap? And digital skills becomes one of the core requirements um, because the early adopters, people who understand what we're talking about and think this is exciting and want to get involved and, and bring their businesses forward. I mean, I've personally got a, uh, an intervention where I'm going to mel- help a million entrepreneurs do exactly that and bridge that gap you're talking about. To do that across 180 countries is very, very different. So I think what I would say to anybody that's listening is what we're talking about is the core of of something very exciting that for those of us where inclusion is our passion, this is actually an area to explore, but only in the context of the work you're delivering. And I talk about that in terms of the value in the inclusion agenda, the value that you're bringing to the world, your contribution. If you can focus this discussion around tech, around that, So, yes, you can go off in a myriad of directions. And do you really need to know about some of the dark web stuff? Maybe. Depends what you're doing. Um, But but I'm effectively putting the collateral together to um, to um, I'm putting the collateral together to um, help entrepreneurs work out which bits they're missing in order to deliver their growth agenda to meet this new economy. I call the empathy economy inclusion leave no one behind I believe this new economy we've designed for the G20 which the UN is adopting is called the empathy economy and I'm bringing those resources online but in the interim I've got a bunch of free resources I want to give to the community and your audience in the meantime if you can focus on the value you're delivering for inclusion and you can look at the contribution you're making if you can expand that to deliver it online and get at least 10% of what you do online, you know, that's how you will deliver it. That's where your customer base is. Maybe we're still doing lots of offline and one-to-ones and all of that. You can get your business and what you do for inclusion to 10% of everything you deliver. You are positioned for this new future I'm talking about. Yep. Yep. I, I, I can see that. This may not be your field of expertise, but uh, what I'm what I'm saying is, you know, there's this anecdote that 80 percent of the jobs that will exist in 2030 haven't yet been created; they haven't even been conceived. Yes. Which means that only 20 percent of what we're doing now will be doing in the future. Correct. And I think, and I think, in a way, COVID probably has accelerated the obsolescence of certain things. You know. We just take a simple thing like ordering a drink at a bar. With the spoons, we're kind of ahead of the game in the UK with this app to order order drinks at the table. And now everybody's playing catch up. So, so a lot of the bar jobs we had, the casual labor jobs, which are often filled by young people, have, are now become obsolete. We're looking at maybe roles like recruiters. We're looking like uh, junior solicitors, junior accountants. These kind of roles are being replaced through either automation, online systems, AI, uh, or end-to-end processes that don't need human interaction. We, what do we need? To, what do we need junior solicitors doing conveyancing when half that process is, is effectively could be automated? So the challenge there is if we don't have a junior solicitor, how do we get a senior solicitor? How, how do we how do we go from this this world where we had to build our expertise through our career to become an expert? How do we get onto that pathway? So is there a danger here where we lose all these junior entry-level roles? through automation and we lose the ability to be experts in the same way that a lot of us are losing the ability to handwrite <laughs> we never start we <laughs> yeah. never writing anymore so we're, we're always typing stuff in so how how do we keep the again go back to the theme leave no one behind mm-hmm. how do we give opportunities to people and retrain them how can we invest in people to give them these new skills they need 
Well, and it's a really good question, and that is exactly central to my uh, United Nations work. And and essentially, where we are is we train the machines because the thing that we need is for the machines to do what I call the heavy lift and shift. A lot of the intro work is actually uh, at the beginning of a career is real drudgery, but it doesn't really require human intellect. So the automation of that means that why wouldn't we do that? Why should a human do that? Um, I'm just thinking on my feet here as to whether I can say that. So for yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it. Um, so for example, fake news. We have um, an AI that is trained um, to understand um, the human emotions on the planet. What do people feel? Now, the one that's in commercially available, there's 20 of the 27. I'm not going to talk about the other seven. because I don't think any of your audience are the cyber criminals. So we'll leave them behind because we don't want to inform them. So just the 20 human emotions. And what it does is it consumes everything that streams. It mainly works on video, but it it does also do some image processing and um, it it does some text. It doesn't do much text because most of what's out there online is not text. And it literally ingests that. It trains on 20 billion different things every single day. So it gets smarter every single day. But what it does is it, it's what's called advisory AI. And this is the new com- career path. The machine does the heavy lift and shift of what I've described. Everything that gets created, 2 billion things every day, it understands that. It looks at, uh, at that against what it's trained. And then it outputs that for humans. The interesting thing about this is, is that's where the exciting work is. Because if I use an example of where this AI is used, If you are a local authority, you're in a local area in the UK and you've got a big event going on, you want to know where you should put your your resources that are, you know, you don't have uh, you don't have endless resources. You want to put your resources doing the right thing. You get the AI to take all the feeds from all the cameras, not looking at who anybody is, don't care who anybody is. But is there something emerging in part of your event space that says, get some people mobilized and over there. And so the the human is saying, well, in this event, that will matter. So yes, um, get that squad of people over there. In this particular event, we've actually, it's an unconference event, and we've asked everybody to just go to where they're more comfortable. So in this event, the human says, no, don't scramble a task force on that. So the machine's done all the heavy lifting shift. When you think about it in terms of fake news, and particularly the arena I work in and safeguarding Gen Z and Gen Alpha, the criminals are exposing our young people to awful things. But then humans have to consume those awful things to know whether we should bring criminal charges. What the machine does is it, because it doesn't feel, uh, it doesn't have mental health problems as a result of consuming the awful content that's out there in the world. And then it gives to the humans that decide whether this matters um, the content that is already classified. And it'll classify this content as mentally acute mental harm or through a spectrum. And so actually the people, we're able to outpace some of the criminals, for example, because people are now employed on doing the the classification, looking at the classification that the AI has created and deciding whether it matters to them today, usually, because it's not a general set of things. What matters today might not matter tomorrow. But equally, if you can imagine that task force of people that are, that are taking the output from that advisory AI, if we have an inclusive group of people, then all of our human skills and talents that decide whether it matters, not just people that have been trained through a linear career path, but people who are a bit more unusual, like Joanne and myself and any of you listening, we could be part of that because we could say, well, to you that might matter, but to us it doesn't. So we start to be able to look at a lens on the world that is including all of us. And putting it contextually. So in this context, this is what inclusion means. 
which is not the same as the context we looked at yesterday. So that's why we say most of the the jobs that we're going to do um, that we're doing now are no longer needed because that advisory role for technology and robotics, and because robotics is my area, being an aerospace engineer, um, that's where the machines will do the heavy lift and shift, the boring stuff, because they don't go on sick, they don't need to holiday, and providing they're in air cool conditions, they don't get too hot like we have today. Um, but then we as humans can bring a hybrid group of inclusive teams to to take that advisory from the machine and decide how we can figure our world. So could we actually say that as we want to evolve our world, then we, we've got three steps to do it. And for now, we can understand this in this context. But as we learn more about what works, we can expand that. And what I say is it's the human at the far, at the center of the industrial internet of things is what delivers the new career path where we leave no one behind. And people often say, well, does that mean that we'll all work five days a week? Quite frankly, I don't really care how often we work. We should choose those things as we start to understand the things that unlock the world that we want to create then we will navigate those journeys. But I would say those linear career paths, which for us on an inclusion agenda, particularly me as a female engineer, stopped my career in its tracks. Now, I found another way in as one of the top 10 um, Internet of Things innovators. I'm an aerospace engineer. So I came back in because IOT is a, an engineering job. But many people would have lost that engineering career and never found a way back. So there is an endemic problem with the way our linear career paths are that don't really allow us to flex our our, our talents. But Gen Alpha and Gen Z will just not tolerate that. They're like, well, that's a that's a barrier I don't recognise, and that's a you know that's a, a door that's closed. Well, I'll I'll dig a tunnel. And so actually, it chimes with the way in which Gen Alpha and Gen Z. Unlock it. So those 40,000 people that literally challenged the G20 were, why have you not considered this for our future workforce? Why are you not looking at all these areas? And when you can speak to every person on the planet that's connected, that's a, a compelling set of evidence that means that the G20 and the United Nations listen. So that's why. And I think we should let go of some of these ways of thinking of things. And and the, and the final point I want to make on that is when you present two million people's voices that are not normally heard to somewhere like the G20, actually what they say is we're excited about that future. We're excited that 80% of the jobs that are being done now are no longer needed because look at the sorts of things we're going to get to do. We can create the world we all want to live in. So our future workforce is very excited. For those of us that have got investments in in a linear career path, possibly less exciting. But if you're listening to this podcast, you understand the impact that inclusion can bring and solving some of the world's biggest problems. Then actually, this is a call to arms to say, you know, see what else you can do. What can you do? Like I said earlier, about bringing 10 percent of what you do online to deliver that value to a wider population. So I, I you know, I, I know the arguments, I know it well, it's the core of my work, but quite frankly, it's a backward looking argument in my view. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm listening to you. So you're obviously, but the, the theme is leave no one behind. And so let's, let's keep bringing us back onto those rails and you used human humanity, those words quite, quite often in what you were just saying, just because we can, it doesn't mean to say we should. So is this path towards AI technology, you know, Skynet, whatever, we want, whatever, the, whatever the technological nightmare it could be, because we can go this route, is it really moving the human needle forward in a way that makes our lives better? Or is it just creating a different version of, of the future than, than maybe um, – going back to the earth, going back to a simpler way of life, where we're just com com making it more complex because we can? Well, I mean, it's a brilliant question. And and I go back to why Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web, for humanity to discover its own truth. All I'm talking about is making those resources available. 
So one of the questions when, so we've talked about Web 3.0 today, whether anybody else knows that, that's in web science world, that's what we talked about. And when we signal to the world, Tim came to London, he did an event with me, um, was the 14th of October, um, 2014. 14th, 9th of October, 2014. And he came and he did an event to announce that Web 2.0 was over. Most people need an explanation for what that was about. And he said, don't worry about it. She's staying. She'll, she'll do the detailed questions. But one of the questions he got when he did that speech was, do you regret it? Do you regret connecting those two protocols, saying hello world, and having the idea that humanity could discover its own truth? And I must admit, I was a little bit taken aback by that question, and he was, and we sort of both looked at one another and thought about it. And he said, I think the underpinning point we have going here is, you think that technology has created something that wasn't already there, but it was. It was there offline. All it's done is made it visible. Because the one thing that's important about what we're talking about here is, the World Wide Web is a fabric of permanence. You leave a digital shadow as a human that, that, that allows you to, to be who you are on that, on that um, resource. And actually, what we effectively do is take the humanity of who we are and create that. And I would say during this coronavirus, um, this pandemic, we've seen both. We've seen an uptick, a huge uptick in criminal activity, but we've seen a huge uptick in humanity federating together, supporting one another. I would say everything we're talking about here about leave no one behind, whether we do it with tech and the future I'm painting or something else, it's there already. That actually is our humanity. That is what that is. And and I'm, you know, I'm of the school, call me Pollyanna. I'm of the school that I have the evidence that says this is right as well. But I'm of a school that says the majority of the world is looking not just to further its own future, but has a social good or a philanthropy about that. We don't we don't do things to harm people. We obviously do things for ourselves, but we don't do them against other people. And and the World Wide Web allows us, technology allows us to put part of ourselves and our values into what we do. And so I would say we'll navigate that. That's why I say at the G20 and the empathy economy I've created um, out of that is around that new social contract. We are renegotiating the social contract at a global level, which before the web we had no mechanism for. But because of the pandemic accelerating that future, we are now re- renegotiating that across the world. I'm personally only involved with 180 countries, but it's happening everywhere. Hmm. Uh, I was watching a, a program on television last night, and it was about a group called the, I think they call the Banderhof. They're a group of a, commun- a global community uh, based in lots of different countries, where they they effectively cut themselves off for technology. They have a religious core to their beliefs and why they get it together, but they fundamentally are are de technologists. They have no technology. They they yeah. may drive tractors and cars and have some. They're not completely isolationary. They have they do have telephones, but they don't have PCs, computers, iPads, mm-hmm. or televisions, so all those things. And I was just watching it thinking, what a simple way of life they have. Mm-hmm. And I was, but they they do have some paralyzed gender views. I mean traditionally the women will get involved in cooking, cleaning, preparing traditional right. kind of female roles. And the women there say, well this is fine. This is what we like doing. Okay, they've been socialized mm-hmm. into thinking that's what they should be doing. And the dressing and the clothing right. they wear is very gender polarized. And they're quite comfortable. They they have a um they have a central bank account. They all produce for the commune, for, for the group. Nobody right. earns money. No, nobody, ha- nobody has any possessions, not even the clothes they wear. They want a pair of shoes. They put in a requisition and a pair of shoes arrives the next day. It's the ultimate online, you know, in-person or, uh, uh, internet delivery, but without the internet. Yeah. And, and it struck me that if we could get to a society where we were allowed to live without having to worry about producing, or we were producing for ourselves in a, in a self-sustainable way in a community. Would that simple life be amazing? And and does this this 
advance in technology get us nearer to that Star Trek utopia of a, a, a currency free world where everything is 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 free and we all have equity and we all we're all able to sit together? Or is it going to create more in, inequity by creating some who can and some who can't? Well, I think again, another good question. And and it'll be what we choose it to be. We associate with our own communities online. I mean, we are a community here discussing this today. And I think one of the things that that gets me up out of bed in the morning is um knowing that Gen Z and Gen Alpha have that ethos around who they are. The G twenty taking account of inclusion for this was because forty percent of the world's GDP is is influenced by them. So that change has already been made. Um, and if if you as an economy need to decide what you're going to do next, you have to take account of the humans that are making their choice, choices. And I would sort of argue whether you're doing it with technology the way we've discussed most of this podcast or doing it the way you've described, John, then that's fine. That's actually the right thing because that's what this is about, making our choices. Um, it's not about some, for me, it's not anything to do with a homogenized version. This is a heterogeneous way of saying, back to Tim's, humanity find its own truth and therefore choosing its own way, choosing the world they want to live in. That's a heterogeneous piece where we all bring our own talents and, and um, needs and we, we navigate it. And that's really what I mean by that social contract. And it's different for us all. And and for me, that is an inclusive world. If that community serves itself, doing for what it's doing, I mean, it, it makes its own choices and it creates no harm and it, it's likely reducing the the resources the, the world needs because it's federating things the way you described it, then actually it'd be more sustainable. It'll be kinder to the planet. It's certainly kinder to the community that choose to live that way. And really, there should not be a one model. There's a multiple set of models, but it's around how do we coexist? How do we collaborate? Say that community got into some sort of trouble and needed help. I would hope then it could connect. It had means of connecting to a community elsewhere or the society at large to get that assistance. But the idea that they can live like that alongside the rest of us doing it differently, brilliant. Isn't that what we're we're after? Te- there will be some elements of technology now, pr- pressing the emergency button where perhaps they will need to navigate by the world we've discussed. But if they can, you know, coexist in that way with all the other things we've talked about, ideally that's what as a, as a human condition we're looking for. We're looking for our place in the world. Social construct, you know, we understand social constructs. We made stuff up. We could change it. You know, it's everything's kind of a social contract. We invented this. Um, but, uh, Gen Alpha, Gen Z, millennials, baby boomers, these are social constructs of, of generation that are probably Western focused, probably Northern Europe or Northern American focused. Does the concept of a, a Gen Alpha exist in Africa? Does it exist in Beirut? You know, with, after all this trouble, do we do we have these same constructs of of generation across societies? And are we in danger of accelerating the growth of the haves and leaving the have nots or leaving the the parts of the world that were underdeveloped? How do we accelerate them and not leave them behind? And and that's really the core of why I accepted the expert advisor role to the UN because if I'm to leave no one behind. That is the question that has to be answered. But it's equally the reason why the G20 plan could not be fitted to the UN, because the world is different. Now, I'm something called the world's first smart city czar, introducing something completely different into this. But what I do is, and, and what I did before this G20 UN work, was actually as a science diplomat on behalf of the UK, sit down with government about looking at the way they were navigating their path. And and essentially, what the biggest piece of work I did was in China. So I was in China for two and a half years, working with the Beijing government, who has its own view of the way their world they want, as we all know. But interestingly, even in China, of the 600 cities that there are, and there are more than 600, but there were 600 that they needed to change, 
Every single one of those was different. In Russia, it's the same. In Iran, it's the same. Um, in Malaysia, in in uh, any any of the Polynesian populations, it's it's the same. The one common thing we have is where humanity gathers and creates its its lifestyle, its communities. Every single one is different. So my new work in Europe, um, now the UK has left Europe, is around 95,000 cities, 500 million people, with 6,700 people looking to navigate that change. But that European intervention that we've started, now we've now the UK has Brexited, can't be taken and put anywhere else. So the work I do in somewhere like uh, Indonesia or Malaysia or anywhere in South America is fundamentally different. But the principles that we talked about today, they all apply. But what it is, is about communities. So the communities in any of the African nations, well, I don't. I never talk about Africa. I talk about them as the African nations because um, whatever I might be doing or saying in Ghana will fundamentally be very different in Nigeria or, Tan- or Tanzania. So, but it, but even within Tanzania in East Africa, um, the communities in Tanzania are all different because we as humans are the difference. And that community you talked about as largely unplugging from technology is uh, a similar thing. So there are millions of those communities across the world and they've navigated their path. But I think we tend to, in the Western world, think somehow that the developing nations are behind. I'd like to remind everybody listening that China is considered a developing nation. It just uses a different model to our Western one. And Japan, where I do an awful lot of work, is a Western nation that does that has many similarities. You know, it has a Western philosophy, but it has many similarities to somewhere like China or, or um, you know, elsewhere like Australia. So I think we we see that I the work I do, I see the world as a connected or disconnected community, and I very much work with the, you know, in the UK, thirteen uh, percent of our population is disconnected in the way we've talked about challenge by challenge or by choice. And it's important to me that whatever we do from, uh, from in flight binary for the connected community, we must work out what the models and the resources and the intervention we can support is for those communities that choose by choice or challenge not to be connected. And I and and the fascinating thing for me is to see this work go from what was the original eight countries, the G8 through to now the G180 and see how many more options we have. Now there's 180 countries instead of the original eight. And quite frankly, I learn more from the African nations than I believe I ever teach or I ever, you know, whatever I put there, they teach me a thousandfold more. You know, so I think that interestingly, if we treat it as a globalized society, but we look at it as a context of communities, that's where we start to navigate it differently. For sure. Yes, it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, as you're talking now, I'm thinking the future. You know, we've talked about the, the kind of current, we've talked about the near future. Let's, so we, 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 you talked to me about uh, Gen Alpha, Gen Z, and how we've got these defining characteristics of these generations and how they're motivated. So we can't be far away from Gen Beta, can we? So what, what do you think is going to be the defining moment for Gen Beta? What are they going to be bringing in? What, what are their expectations going to be? Well, I mean, obviously, I get my crystal ball out, polish it down, and I, I've got evidence around that. But I can I can give you a real-life illustration and, and an actual story around that, which I think encapsulates the answer to that. So um, Gen Z are the children of the millennials. So that's who they are. And largely, um, they are the ones that are are now uh, influencing 40% of the economic spend. So one thing we know that Gen Beta will do will accelerate that. They they largely will be the cohort using the 80-20 rule. They'll be where the direction of spend and influence is for definite. During lockdown, I've done a lot of work supporting 
uh, the safeguarding of our children. Criminals have, have uh, were very prepared for the pandemic and the move online. That's where they work. So one of the things they've done, um, they have uh, accessed our children. And so a lot of my work has been around that. And one of the, uh, uh, so I work with networks of people uh, and, and and do this work that way. I'm sort of struggling a little bit because there's stuff I can't say because um, obviously I don't know who's going to listen to this. But um, I think that um, one of the, the network groups who reached out in a, a bit of a flat panic around um, something that happened with something they'd organized online um, was around uh, end of year like get togethers as, as some of Gen Alpha were transitioning from primary school to secondary school in the UK. They were effectively, it's a rite of passage in the, in the Western world and, and in the UK. And so normally they would have a get together as a cohort. And um, that had been, that had been infiltrated by criminals. So we, I worked with this community and one of the mums said to me, um, she's a millennial and she's raising um, Gen Alpha. And she said to me, I sort of need some support. I know what you're going to say. I'm like, okay, Sam, tell me. She said, well, we got downstairs this morning to find all three of them. She's got triplets. All three of them sat there, dressed, breakfasted. There were two pads, two, pe- two pens on the table. And my husband and I came down. They weren't late or anything. It was some morning. And, and we're told, sit down. You've had how many months now? How many months have you had to navigate this new world? And how well have you done? Not well. And so sit down. You, you can have coffee later. This is important. And they were given two pads, two pens, and told to take notes. And within the day, that household was reorganized to the way Gen Alpha needed to be. And so if, you, if Gen Alpha, who, can, who, are, who are children of the millennials, can literally just reorganize an entire household. And Sam was right. She knew what I was going to say. I said, you didn't stop them, did you? You didn't argue, did you? And she said, no, because actually they had a point. And if they had a plan or they were going to help us put a plan to make our family function together in this unusual situation, we needed to listen. And so th- those triplets, then they're six. I perhaps didn't say that. Um, so they're six and they have reorganized that household. And um, it turns out their teacher is a friend of Sam. And so Sam told the teacher to say, I'm not quite sure what is going gonna, is gonna to happen. But quite frankly, this has happened to me. And the teacher, who is an amazing teacher, said, I'm going to get them to support the class. So she got the whole class looking at the next year that they were moving into as part of their transition about what would you change about what this school's doing? You know, we've had how many years putting this school system together and what's wrong with it? And I think that's what it's at. So what will Gen B to do? They will amplify that. It will be, you know, beyond that because they are the children of Generation Z. And Gen Z started this whole thing off um, because they literally are biologically as a generation different. And I talk about these cohorts, which are not Western cohorts, they're global cohorts from a web science point of view. So so we are already preparing the technology for Gen Beta because I'm lucky enough to have great nieces and nephews that I, are already telling me what they need. So I have done mentoring sessions for my six-year-old great nephew, and he will launch his first business at Christmas when he's seven, because quite frankly, he just can't wait any longer to get this thing shifted. And my niece is really good at doing what she's told. (laughs) And I think that's what Gen Beta will do. There's no doubt about it, because they see things very clearly. Inclusion is who they are. And they want to, making the world a better place is, is the reason they open their eyes in the morning and get on. So if Curious is Gen Alpha, I'm not quite sure what we call Gen Beta yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Me too. It sounds really exciting. And 
I think as long as we keep looking over our shoulder, making sure we're not leaving people behind, we, 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 we think inclusively and we bridge those gaps where people are struggling and we don't speak always through a privileged lens and expect people to keep up without the tools. As long as the government, the infrastructure and people like yourself are still thinking about everybody, that's going to be the future. And didn't you tell me earlier that you produced some free resources uh, for the isolation economy? Yeah, so, so so as we came out of the isolation economy, a lot of what I've talked about today is the mechanism we use to unlock it. But I realised that actually all of this sounds marvellous, but, but people need to do something now. So I've created what I call the empathy economy because that's what I believe I've talked about to you today. And I've created some free resources before I launched my initiative to support a million entrepreneurs to move wholly into this. Um, empathy economy online. I've produced some free resources. Um, I've also produced some resources with the help of the mums that I've been safeguarding Gen Alpha with around the Zoom platform, um, which is something we call a cyber safe resource, um, which, you know, um, is, is the way I've packaged what I've learned from safeguarding our children and I'm packaging it out as how to be cyber safe in our new um, you know, post isolation economy, and and I'll, I've got all of those resources, and I, I want to make sure that you a you can connect with me, b you can actually have these resources as a created, and c you can have some of the resources we've already got all for free, because at the end of the day we're talking about creating a ripple around the idea we're all delivering value from an inclusion perspective to create the world that we all want to live in. And and I feel it's part of my responsibility to pass those resources on to for you to all use, for you to all pass on, because you are part of the early task force making that change. And I'm I'm just I feel privileged to be able to do this podcast. I love the work that Joanne does. Obviously I delight to to have met her and and you know dialogued on all of this. But the reality of it is we are at the very front end of a change that is a global change. It's hugely exciting. So I feel it's my responsibility to pass those resources on and give you the, the means to get going. And obviously, I'll, I'll make sure that that means that you get updates with anything else that I create, because it's going to be down to all of us. This is a very big change I'm talking about. So it's not just me and the people I know. You are all part of that change as well. Huge okay, so, so so everyone's really dying to download this. Where do, they, where do they find this stuff? Do they go to your website? Do they? Is there a link? Tell us. Well, exactly. So so how do you do this, Jackie? That's tricky. So what I thought was I created something out of the safeguard because it, it's like the the tip of the iceberg. If I give you the start point, then you navigate it the way you want to navigate it. So I've created the resources with the help of the support of the mums of using the Zoom platform. Now, you may not use the Zoom platform, but you possibly know other people that do, so you can just pass this on. And it's Zoom, so, you know, everybody does I spell that, dot, Jackie. Now, I'm a Jacqueline, so and that's J-A-C-Q-U-I, dot online, because that's what we've talked about today. Zoom, dot Jackie, J-A-C-Q-U-I, dot online. And if you go there, that gives you access to the CyberSafe resource so that you can make any Zoom interactions you have CyberSafe and, you know, and do give that away to anybody in your community or anybody you know that uses it. And then that gets you into my world because, of course, I have a chance to do that without the cyber criminals knowing that we've done it. And then um, you'll get access to the other resources that will give you access to the rest of it because it's a, how I create the entry point. So zoom.jackie.online is the entry point. Excellent. Well, I'll put that in the show notes. I'll make sure I tag you in on that. Um, I'm, uh, in fact, as soon as we hang up, I'm going to go and check that myself and find out what it's all about. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite excited right. now. I've been listening to you. Um, well, thanks, Jackie. I mean, it's been an amazing. I mean, we could carry on talking for another hour or so, and I'm, I'm sure we're down this rabbit hole. We could branch off to so many different topics <laughs> and yeah. still only touch the, ice, the tip of the iceberg, as, as we're saying. And it is an amazing, amazing uh, talk we've had this morning. And I'm I'm really excited that I'm sure the listeners are also being mesmerized by by listening to you and they have loads of questions. So can they get in touch with you on LinkedIn or can, can they connect with you that way? 
Yeah, so so using the zoom.jackie.online, it'll give access to those and you'll be able to connect with me. And my wider work is shared on LinkedIn. The link, the link is there. I do have an Empathy Economy Facebook group where we can have safe conversations about some of the specifics, probably even more detail than we talked today, because there are many pitfalls around all of this and we individually have our own perspective so that's a safe space and then i have again there's the zoom.jackie.online i have a page on facebook which um uh, is called cyber safe entrepreneurs where i will put information out there that i don't mind the criminals seeing um, because it's always good to tell them more onto them about what how you can become cyber safe of the new things so for example yesterday i talked about the origins of all of this work because yesterday was the anniversary um, since 1939 of when the uh, pre-resources, before we had uh, the National Cyber Security Centre in the UK, of the people that moved into a place called Bletchley Park, if you never visited, you should, um, and because it's one of the amazing places. And it was the anniversary uh, yesterday of of the move into Bletchley Park. And Bletchley Park is where some of these resources are too. So um, all of that, the CyberSafe page, you can, if you check the CyberSafe Entrepreneurs page, which is say it's part of the Zoom download, um, check that out. You'll see all the good stuff. And then the little insider, Bletchley tip, as we call it, about how to get Code Breakers lunch. Because the Code Breakers are the ones that effectively allowed us to win a war such that our democracy um, is able to have this conversation today. And the bit I didn't put on there, but I'll tell you all, is Codebreakers Lunch is officially sausage and mash. Because <laughs> that's what the Codebreakers ate in order to help to crack the Enigma code. <laughs> if you've got onion gravy with that, that would be even better. So sausage well, and mash, gravy onion gravy. It, yeah. You have to have carrots with it. And you carrots go to hot, hot four. If you go to hot four to eat that in Bletchley Park, that's the place that Alan Turing and the team sat down to eat their lunch. And you can go sit where they sat and eat sausage and mash. Fantastic. That sounds like a real <laughs> treat. So just to remind people, it's zoom.jackie.online, and that's J-A-C-Q-U-I, is it? That's right. It's J-A-C-Q-U-I dot online. Wow. Thank you. Um, once again, amazing. And also to the listeners, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Um, your support is, is very appreciated. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, please do email me at joe.lockwood at cchangehappen.co.uk. I would also encourage you to subscribe to keep updated on future episodes of the Inclusion Bytes podcast. That's B-I-T-E-S. Tell your friends, tell your colleagues. I've got a number of other exciting guests lined up over the next few weeks and months. And uh, if you'd like to listen to this and you'd like to be a guest on the show, then please do let me know. I'm always looking for great, fantastic people to share their insight. And if you've got any comments or feedback, I'd also welcome that as well. So my name is Joanne Lockwood, and it's been an absolute pleasure to be your host of this podcast for you today. And I look forward to catching up with you next time. Bye. <laughs>